Good morning, everybody. Good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here with us today. My name is Maria Christine. I'm the, di the curatorial director of 2022 Design Miami. Welcome. Uh, this uh, talk, Working Within a Legacy, uh, is been, uh, will, be, will be led by Francesca Molteni, and we will have Eckhart Meiser from IMS Institute and Lisa Carmona from ETEL. Thank you very much. Good morning, everybody, and we are very, very glad to have you here, Lisa Carmona and uh, Eckhart Meiser. It's really a pleasure uh, to host this conversation. Working within a legacy, it's a very important topic today in design all over the world, and we are happy to have from Switzerland to Brazil to Italy somehow to underline the importance of the rediscovering masterpieces uh, as often hidden in, uh, in the archives, uh, private, uh, public, uh, uh, from the families. It's a long story and a very, very deep topic that we are today discussing. So it's a pleasure to have here Lisa Carmona, who is the CEO and director of ETEL. She's graduated in business administration, so she will tell us why she moved to design. <laughs> and she's the curator and joined ETEL in 1995. Uh, you are very interested in researching history of Brazilian design, and now she's responsible to tell as being a peer pioneer in the preservation of history. Uh, we will talk a lot about the designers that you help us rediscovering, uh, but the project, let's say, it, it's also linked to foundations, institutions, which is another important uh, topic of the discussion today. And Eckhart Meise, uh, he is a, let's say, a strategic consultant, so has a very important and, and particular point of view on the legacy topic. Uh, he works on brand and design projects with the IMS office, uh, the design firm founded in 1941 by Charles and Ray IMS, our couple, our heroes all over the world, let's say. Uh, with experience in design masterpieces, uh, um, also back to the chief design uh, officer of Vitra, where you were responsible for building up the Jean Prouvé collection, so we're talking about big names today, among many other things, and in charge also for publications uh, for the Vitra Design Museum. That is very important because uh, publications, uh, books uh, can help uh, the heritage to, let's say, to be not just alive, but also to testify the importance of some rediscoverings again. So I would like to give to Eckhart first uh, uh, the stage to introduce briefly with a presentation what he is doing. Thank you Thanks so much, uh, Francesca and, and Marie Christina. So I'm, I'm here actually speaking on behalf of the IMS office. And I would like to introduce the IMS office briefly to you. There's also an IMS Institute. I will get to that a little bit later. Um, it's a different institution. So the IMS office um, was founded in 1941 by Charles and Ray IMS, and this is their this was their studio. It was this multi you know um, multi dimensional um, uh, studio that worked obviously on furniture, um, which is very well known and has always been in production ever since but they also worked on many other media. They worked on film, they worked on toys, they worked on exhibitions, they worked on, on uh, communication design. Um, so there was, a, there was a, a big variety of, of work and I don't think we, you know, if we started introducing their work now, the time wouldn't be sufficient. So maybe just to scratch the surface, what is interesting when it comes to legacy is that the IMS office has never ceased to, to exist. So the IMS office 
still exists today, and it is uh, is run by the family, by the Eames family, by the by the third generation, so the grandchildren of Charles and Ray, and already the fourth generation is also now in the in the um, active in the Eames office. So it's really important to understand this element of um, being a family office. Obviously, the mission has changed, and the identity and the character has changed over time. So when Charles Eames passed away in 1978, and then Ray Eames passed away uh, on the day 10 years later in 1988, after that, it was not an, a design practice anymore like before, but it became some kind of a cultural and commercial project with the mission to, um, to preserve, communicate, and extend the legacy of Charles and Ray Eames. And I just put these circles up um, first because I also went to business school like you. So that's what we do when we're like <laughs> trained in business school, right? And um, secondly, because I think it's important to understand there is uh, three elements of, of the mission and they overlap and you cannot separate them. There's many ways of overlapping and uh, the actual, the little triangle in the middle, it's much bigger than it looks on the, on the graph because the most interesting spot is actually where, this, where these three elements of the mission overlap. And the arrows symbolize that this is very dynamic. So taking care of a legacy is something very dynamic over time. It changes, the challenges change, the situation changes, and um, the projects change. So it's never something static. It's not you do it once and it's done. And um, I just would like to briefly go through, and I hope uh, that the images are very small, just as illustrations, but just to show um, some aspects of it. So when we think about uh, preservation, it is obviously a lot. It's about collections and the archives and uh, the, Eames, uh, the Eames office Charles and Ray worked for um, 37 years, and uh, he worked uh, in the office until he passed away. It was 37 years, and then 10 more years where Ray worked by herself with the team. So it was a very long time, and there are huge archives because there was such a multitude of work and projects, but also just uh, just always this um, systematic archiving of things. Yeah? So the Eameses always archived uh, the process. They were very much about the process. So there were massive, massive um, um, collections and archival materials. And um, this is a, an important element for the family until today. So the first part was already organized by Charles and Ray. They decided to give the document archive, which is close to a million um, archival objects to the Library of Congress in, in Washington. And then some of it went to other museums, like the Vitra Design Museum, for example, here nearby. Um, and then it's, but the work still continues because it's about the film archive, it's about digitalizing the film archive, it is about creating a digital photo archive that is available. And now, more recently, um, a, a big part of the collection um, 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 now found a home in what is the Eames Institute, which is a new institution that is not uh, part of the Eames office, but shares the same overall mission. So finally, this collection, which is also about 70,000 three-dimensional objects and materials from the Eames office now found a home. So you see that over decades, archiving and, and uh, working with collections and museum collections, institutional and private collections is an important element. The second one, as you already mentioned in your introduction, is, the, is obviously publications and the educational programs and, and the communication, also through exhibitions. So the work uh, with institutions, with museums, and um, uh, with publishers and with educational institutions is really also a, a core part of the mission of the Eames office. And it's, a co it's a continuous to the point where the Eames office um, started their own gallery and ran a gallery in, in Los Angeles um, for uh, about a decade in the 2000s. So there's, there's a lot of activity also in that field. The third element, and here we are in preserving and extending at the same time. This is the continuous production and reissues of works by the designers. And this is the core, I think, also of the talk. But it's also how Charles and Ray Eames' work is very much perceived in, in the public. Why? Because these furniture, mostly furniture designs, have been in continuous production with longtime partners, Herman Miller since 1946, Mitra since 1957 and they have been a success in the market. So there's many of them around. So Eames has never really been, in the furniture field, has never been able to be rediscovered because it was always actually out there. 
And uh, part of my work with the EAMS office now is to work on the other areas of their work. Yeah? So for example, toys, works of art, architecture, films, and these kind of things that were not in the lucky position to be always manufactured. And the fourth element um, then of our mission is, is, new, is work with new brands, with new categories, to extend the work to new categories. And this is really extending in a different way because this is based on the work of Charles and Ray, sometimes using graphic patterns or other elements, but it's working also with very popular, very accessible product categories. And this is extremely important to us because together with the, the other work, obviously, especially the communication, exhibitions, publications, this helps us to keep the legacy going. And each generation will rediscover EAMS in a different way. And sometimes you get criticized for doing sneakers, for example, but then if you see the effect that the average demographics on a website changes dramatically to a younger generation, it really serves a purpose in, in driving that legacy forward. We will discuss it later, but <laughs> it's a very, shoes, very important sure. <laughs> part of the... No, yeah, yeah, but the, um, it's, so it's not a... Exactly, it's not a coincidence, it's really, part of the, it's really part of the strategy and part of the mission is to always help new generations, young people, to discover and obviously they will discover it in different ways from people that discovered at the, in the days of Charles and Ray or in the 90s or in the 2000s. Um, so this is um, maybe the overall picture and the important thing I already mentioned a couple of the partner institutions is a, a, le a legacy always depends on partners, it depends on, on activity, it depends on a network of partners, whether it's museum like Vitro Design Museum, Henry Ford Museum, MoMA and others, whether it's institutions that, that are kind of in the EAMS office, or in, sorry, in the EAMS universe, yeah, so for example the EAMS Institute which was founded this year or went public this year in Northern California about the collection but also about um, learning from Charles and Ray for the future and or the Eames Foundation which was founded about 15 years ago with only the one mission is to preserve and, um, and, and open and keep the Eames house open, yeah, keep the Eames in, in, and preserve the Eames house. Vitra, Herman Miller and the furniture are other companies that we've been working with for 50, 60, 70 years, um, the same in the publishing and then obviously a couple of new partners in the new fields. Um, this is important uh, that we have this network because in this network you can also ensure then the authentic experience because the authentic experience of an EAMS design um, always has many ways uh, to be expressed and it's in different locations, it's in different, um, yeah, it's about different uh, types of product and diff different categories. So the, 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 this authentic experience depends on that network. It goes even further because it includes for example, a furniture dealer, or it includes uh, a journalist, or it, can includes, it, it just includes um, many people and many layers that are part of that story. And uh, to finish, um, very quickly, maybe just to show two examples of this authentic, authentic experience, because there is a lot of discussion also around the topic of the original, and there is two very different understandings, obviously, when it's art or when it's design, and then it depends even what type of design are you talking about. So in the case of uh, the work of Charles and Ray, designs that were made for industrial production, the original is not only the chair that Charles and Ray had at their home, you see it in the bottom left here, you see them sitting in the Eames house on a lounge chair, but it's also about um, every chair basically that was manufactured ever since until today. So we like to put it in a way that the, the chair that Charles and Ray intended is actually the last one that went off the production. Yeah? So, and over that time, together with, and that's a very important role of the Eames office to keep that legacy, is these discussions, that dialogue, and this kind of conscious um, um, decision making also to be true to the intentions of Charles and Ray, but also to the situation of today. So on the top right, for example, you see there was a project of mine when I was still at Vitra, is we made the Eames lounge chair bigger. Why? Because people are about 10 centimeters taller on average than when the chair was designed. So this was, it looks like nothing, but it was a work of two years. Yeah, just so to illustrate that it's hard work. And many other things that have developed over the time. And the second um, example is a, is a re-edition that we worked on with the Eames office. 
of a sculpture. So on the left you see a sculpture from 1943, amazing um, abstract organic shape um, uh, that uh, they was made as a work of art. At the same time, and that makes it interesting, it was what you maybe in the industry you could, would call it the technology carrier. So it really helped them to develop the technology of plywood about two or three years before they made the furniture. So this piece is um, is an amazing um, yeah, witness of technological evolution at the same time. And here it's very much to think about what was the what was the intent, was what what was the artist's intent, and how did they do that? How did they do this piece? So we really had to understand how they made it on the inside, because it's done with a lot of different layers of veneer in different areas. The thickness changes from six to fourteen millimeters. You need a very complex mold to make it. So in the end, we made an, a limited edition of twelve pieces, which we are now placing with other museums that are not in the lucky situation like the Vitra Design Museum, who has one of the two that were made in the 40s um, and in collections. And here it was very different. This was much more like to create what I like to call almost like a facsimile edition. While if you're in the design field, it changes very much over time. So just from my side, very quickly, maybe the introduction to the Eames office and the work of the Eames office and some examples and maybe also thank some food for discussion later yeah, on. For yeah, for sure. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you very much. Thank you so much, uh, Eka. Yeah. It's very interesting to go deeper into this because we think we know everything, not somehow because we are in the design field, so we know, oh, IMSS, it's obvious. No, not at all, because the story of the changement of the, of the legacy, it's much more interesting. Lisa, do you mind to introduce uh, as your, uh, let's say, work and your job, so then we will have more food for the discussion? <laughs> uh, no, not at all. It's a pleasure. First of all, thank you, Mara Cristina, for the kind invitation. Thank you, Francesca and Eckert. It's really a pleasure to share the stage with you and especially to talk about the legacy of Brazilian design and the importance of the reedition. 2022 is a very special year for Brazil. 200 years ago, we were celebrating our independence from Portugal. This year uh, is quite busy and quite special as well because we have also celebrated the 100 years of the Semana de Arte Moderna de 22, or the Modern Art Week of 1922, and also the centennial of the great Polish-Brazilian designer, Jorge Zalzupin. I will do a very, very fast time travel to the past record uh, to really give the essence and a broader perspective on Brazilian uh, design on the historical part of it. Let me just use this. Well, as I said, a century ago, a group yeah, in the city of Sao Paulo, a group of very talented artists of all kinds, poets, writers, painters, architectures, uh, sculptures, they presented what is called the iconic Semana de Arte Moderna, or the Modern Art Week uh, of 1922. And this iconic event, this movement, sought to create a new identity for Brazil that was at the same time aligned with the European modernity, with the European vanguard, but also that could reflect it, our greatness, our culture, our people, our nature in a way. So among the talented artists, among the Brazilians, they were the first European that arrived in Brazil. The Swiss, as we are in Switzerland, the Swiss uh, John Grass, a painter, a sculptor, Lazar Segal, who did the first modern art exhibition, and I thought this is interesting to bring for a design fair related to the art fair uh, in Brazil in 1913, and also the Ukrainian architect Gregory Vashashek, who played a very important role in Brazilian modern architecture, but also built the first modernist house in the city of Sao Paulo. Shortly after that, in the city of Rio de Janeiro, modern architecture was booming, was flourishing through the works of Oscar Niemeyer and Lucio Costa, who together with other important architects from Rio, built the first impressive modern built in Brazil, the super famous Palacio de Capanema, uh, the minister, the headquarters of the Minister of Health Education, who had Le Corbusier, now bringing back to, to Europe as a consultant. This building was uh, a landmark project, was featured all over and had a great repercussion on, uh, on the design, on the architecture scene of that time. 
In the 40s, Brazil was considered the most important country for architecture, was considered uh, the country of the future. There's a beautiful romance called Brazil, the country of the future. MoMA, as we are talking about MoMA, Eckhart, uh, dedicated an entire exhibition entitled Brazil Built for the Greatness of Our Architecture with an incredible repercussion in Germany and also here in Switzerland. The apogee, the golden age, to stick to the theme of the fair uh, of the Brazilian modern design furniture occurred in the 50s with the arrival, now bringing, relating to Italy, Francesca, of the couple of the architect, Lina Bobardi uh, and her husband Pietro Bardi from Italy, Jorge Zalzupin from Poland, Scapinelli also from Italy, and Tenhero from Portugal. So together, uh, as it occurred in the beginning of the century, in the 20s, uh, when the first pioneers from Europe arrived and quickly became part of our Brazilian intelligentsia, the newcomers as Lina, Zalzupin, Tenhero, they rapidly became, uh, they integrated with our Brazilian masters, Oscar Niemeyer, Sergio Rodriguez, uh, uh, Zanini Caldas, and many others. And then together is what we call the true anthropophagic movement, where the two cultures, the Brazilian and the European cultures, they melted, they were digested, and then returned as something, uh, an aesthetic completely new and fresh. So we can see the result of the masterpieces uh, that was brought together with the interference of the Europeans and the Brazilians. It's important to highlight here the name and the work of the Portuguese Joaquim Tenheiro, probably the most known name uh, for furniture design. Tenheiro, from a family, from a traditional family of woodworkers, was at the same time an exquisite and extraordinary artisan, but also an art. And this is important to highlight how Brazilian furniture design was pretty much related to art, to architecture, and of course, to furniture makers. The bold work of Joaquim Tenheiro is somehow the synthesis of Brazilian modern furniture design. Sculpture and artisanal at the same time. Exquisite wood craftsmanship. The beauty of our national, our tropical wood to its best. And also borderline between art and design. After that, so after this apogee, this golden age, shortly after Brazil, the inauguration of Brasilia, our capital, was at the same time the highest achievement, the top. It was the greatest utopia ever built, again, by Oscar Niemeyer and Lucio Costa, but also the decline of our important modernism. Shortly after that, Brazil became close. We had a military coup. Uh, the culture of oblivion was installed, and we lost many of our great minds, as the case of Nehemiah, that went on exile uh, in France. In a way, uh, it's interesting to understand here that this magnificent production uh, of Brazilian modern furniture has been veiled for more than decades, even for us, even for the internal audience, even for the Brazilian. Today, and I mean like since 20 years, since the beginning of the year 2000, it has caught again the attention of many collectors, many specialists around the globe. Uh, in a way, it is a sense of a treasury with a delayed uh, discovery because it's really been hidden or left aside. And curiously, and this is something that I found particularly interesting, it is at the same time, the aesthetics of Brazilian modern furniture design, it is Francesca at the same time original, familiar, I would say, and original. Familiar because we were talking about this melt, this stay of two continents, the interaction between Europe and the Brazilian, and fresh because they were really something that the two cultures were melted, uh, digested, and then returned 
with something uh, very, very fresh, very new. And now, after this very, very fast trip to the past, uh, I would like to talk about the work of Atel. Uh, since 1990, we've been responsible for not only editing the masterpiece, but especially for preserving the memory, protecting the legacy of all these great masters. Not only the Brazilians, but also the Brazilian, the European Brazilian, as the case of Lina Bobardi, Zhao Zuping, and many, many others. We work directly and exclusively in a very close partnership with all the foundations, as I said. The case of Oscar Niemeyer, I'm also the director of the Oscar Niemeyer Foundation. The case of Lina Bobardi with Bardi Institute, uh, with uh, Sergio Rodriguez when he was among us uh, for special pieces, and now with his institute. And uh, our, uh, we are very pleased, very honored to have been uh, worked with Zhao Zupin himself for more than 20 years. I'm responsible for his legacy. Uh, we just opened last year his house. We turned his house, his residence, into a Casa Museo, occurred more in that direction of communicating, preserving the legacy. So we are now working with his archives, digitalizing, organizing, rediscovering, and then turning to public. So those are some examples of how we do it, uh, how we work so close. Here you can see Zhao Zupin himself, his daughter Veronica, our atelier in Sao Paulo, and now the house, how it was, and now uh, how it is. Thank you, so we have more food for the Thank conversation. You so <laughs> Thank you so much, Lisa. Now, it's very, very interesting to compare a little bit the stories with the similarities uh, and, let's say, contradictions or differences in the stories. I had the, ch the chance a few years ago to work uh, on the Gioponti collection uh, for Molteni and Sima and family company. I'm not working for the company, but as it was a, a, a hot, uh, let's say, potato, we call it. <laughs> uh, why don't you help us? Uh, no, <laughs> to And the problem there, for example, was that there was no foundation, meaning that the hires, uh, the nephews, uh, the family around uh, were eight people sitting at the same table, discussing and deciding all together what's going on with the Gioponti heritage. But that was it, not an official, let's say, uh, institution taking care of the heritage. So, Eckhart and Lisa, what are for you the really the main topics of the archive and the institution. What does it mean? Because people from, let's say, the audience and at home, they don't know exactly what does it mean to work with an archive and why it's so important to have these, uh, let's say, institutions uh, to work on people from the past, uh, because Gioponti was died, maybe when, when it's a different story for the IMS, but let's say that usually archives and institutions or foundations are built after when the designers, the architects are not there anymore. So it's interesting to understand what we can find into that treasure, closed uh, archives. Um, yeah, so the question, I mean, for the for the for IMS, but I think it's true for every a designer, an architect, an artist, I mean, the simple answer is because it's part of our culture. So it deserves to, to be preserved and to be communicated. And of course, every case is different, you know, in dimension, maybe in importance, in relevance, uh, and in, in, type, in types of work and so on. But it's just, uh, it's part of the culture. This is why it's also uh, interesting, but also logical to hear also the work that you are doing, because it's just as much commercial and it is cultural. And the same is true for the Joe Ponte fund, uh, archives or for, for the Eames, uh, in, you know, the, the, the Eames office and the Eames family. And I think that is, uh, that's really the short answer. And the, and the longer one is obviously that it's available for researchers, it's available for, it's available for publications, it's available for collaborations, maybe more in the commercial field. It's just, it's just part of our cultural heritage. And, and I think that is, it's not just design as an applied art or something like that, and it's really part of the cultural heritage. And uh, I think it's it's a challenge, obviously, to do that. That's why I, in the in in my short presentation, I tried to point out that you cannot do it alone. 
because it's it's thousands and thousands and thousands of things and to to um, you know to take an archive from a from a from a design studio or an architectural studio and catalog it and work with it is a is a work of years and decades and not of days and weeks so i think that is a, it's really challenging this is why you need also i think if you're in the case of the eameses you have family who's working on that you need to align with partners you need to you need to you need to create these kind of collaborations with uh, also with important institutions because it just goes beyond your capacities <laughs> to take care of something like that that's true and wh what is your experience uh, I believe you name it, uh, you nailed it, uh, Eckhart. First, because it's part of our culture, and especially the reason that I did this like, quick trip to the past and to the Brazilian culture is because it's part of our identity. So the reflection of Brazilian identity is pretty much through architecture, through design, and through this legacy. And especially in Brazil, where we have this kind of break between uh, the apogee, the golden age, and then now the rediscover is being quite a challenge to reorganize, to catalog, to deal with the families. And sometimes, as the case of Gioponti, it was exactly the same situation. Brazil and Italy, we are very close. <laughs> I'm half Italian, half Brazilian. <laughs> it is the same. I remember when we was, uh, I started working with uh, the legacy and with the history, and we mentioned publications. So the first book uh, in Portuguese about Brazilian design, Brazilian modern furniture design, was launched in our gallery in 1993. Before that, there was nothing on our history. Uh, and still, this book took us uh, like more than 10 years to translate it to English. So I'm now responsible, as a tell, to publish, to promote, to sponsor literature, because we need it. And even for us, Francesca, so when I mean that the family, like the Ponte family, or like seven, 10, I remember the first family that came to us in 1998, there were 11 heirs. They, for a long time, they haven't met. So they just met, they just been reunited to uh, sign an agreement of us to bring back the pieces to life. So bringing, and now uh, you mentioned the commercial side of it, but much more than the commercial side, to bring an iconic piece back to life, to add it or to re-add it, we need all of this background. We need a history to come back. We are more like, we need to support the families to organize the archives, their institutions, the institute. In the case of Zhao Zuping, his archive, his atelier has been closed for more than 40 years. We are now like open the archives with museologists, with dedicated and capable personnel to deal with it, catalog, organizing, and then oh, making it open to the public. So it's been, it's really a challenge, Francesca, but it's something that needs to be done. It's beyond us, uh, it's beyond the company, it's more related even to the country, to, our, to preserve our identity, our history. At the same time, I think that without companies and brands, nobody would have uh, the, let's say, the energy to make the effort, for sure not the Italian, uh, let's say, government state, because we have so many to preserve, so many artists, architectures, buildings, and uh, that design, I have to tell you, that at least in Italy was perceived in the past as not less important, but let's say, to have an original uh, uh, work by De Chirico and to preserve it and to study, and it was really important. But not a Giaponti piece, maybe not, not because they were industrial designers, but because of the industry in itself. To have uh, a series of pieces, uh, meaning the, the meaning of industrial design, not, not just a, an art piece, one single piece, and not even a limited edition, but to have many uh, available would mean somehow a, a diminution of the value of the importance. What is your experience uh, as with the, with the IMS that were never really out of production because they were <laughs> always into the market, let's say? Yeah, I mean, the, the, it's, for me, it's more the question of relevance. And as you're talking about the market, it's also what is, what is relevant today. And the Eames, a lot of the Eames furniture, I'm not mainly talking about the furniture, but also other aspects of their work, has just proven their relevance over and over, you know, in every generation and in every generation, um, also in the market, in the, in the, in the furniture market. And uh, 
This makes it, makes it uh, relevant, but not always interesting in the sense that it's interesting for collectors because it's not rare. Yeah? It, has been, it has been out there for in, in large quantities, so for collectors, it's, it's interesting, maybe the very early pieces, but then they, you talk more, you're still more on the vintage market and not in the high-end collector's market, or just pieces that were experiments and that were you know, kind of uh, from these really early days. So I think, but this relevance is maybe something that is, has to be discovered also by each generation. And I'm not an art historian, but I think the same maybe also applies to, to, to research and to, and to art history or design history because it's what is relevant and what is felt to be relevant, of course, also has it easier to get attention maybe from the state or from <laughs> cultural institutions, publications, and obviously, um, the, you know, in case of uh, product design, furniture design, if something is, stays in the market or is brought back to the market, that of course also increases that relevance. What, what is, how is working in Brazil and with your pieces that are not just for the Brazilian, yeah. let's say, market? I believe it's interesting to bring back to this statement that I just present, like the originals of today, the vintage of tomorrow, Francesca. And when we deal with addition and re-addition, this exposure, how far can we get? Uh, and this is like the market. So we, are, we work with Japan, we work with Korea, we work with Vancouver, uh, with Dubai, here in Switzerland. So the pieces, they carry also the knowledge. They carry the conoscenza, as we say, in Italian. So this is really important because if they are limited pieces or one of a kind of the one, the companies, Francesca, and the industry, probably not everyone in Brazil would have known about Gioponti because they were like the archives, the Lina Bobar, this correspond, they were like kind of hidden inside that small museum, etc. But now because of the company of Motelni, of the tail of Vitra, of Imi's uh, office, people, the great audience, they have access to the pieces and then to the history. So I believe this is the role. How can we make this exposure broader uh, and we reach like a larger audience and then we acclaim the respect that they deserved and the history uh, that it's, it's important. So this brings us to the question, to the issue of uh, authenticity and originality, let's say. What is an original? It's a big discussion and we will not solve it today. But let's say, what is a copy and how we can protect somehow the original through the the intellectual property, the, let's say, the registration, all the, the, the acts, the actions that we can do in terms of uh, having uh, the prototype, the original, and then understand what is a copy and what is not. Yeah, this is a really complex topic. So if, uh, because already the definition of original is, is, is very different if you have an industrial you know, let's say mass manufactured piece, you have many originals, each of them is an original, they look very different. In the case of EAM, sometimes you have to, you, maybe you know there have always been two manufacturers, Vitra and Herr Miller, so the versions look different already between those two, you cannot tell, uh, you know, or you can tell, but it's also in a way not so relevant because they're all originals. And, um, and then if it comes to authenticity, obviously you have the contemporary production is, is, is always threatened by the copycats and by the, by the unauthorized production. And, and uh, for more on the historic production, you just simply, you have fakes, fakes, I mean, you have falsifications, you have like fake antiques and you have fake, fake, uh, fake mid-century designs or something, right? So it's just getting faked at the same time. And the, and the threat of the, co of the copyists is in the end, it's always a damage to the consumer because authenticity, is about is about uh, the kind of the unity and it's about the the unity of the experience and it's that the provenance guarantees you this unity of the experience so it's really about the intent of the um, the intent of the designer the intent of the manufacturer it's about the experience of quality it's about the ex experience of durability and many other elements it's about the artistic experience expression emotions all of that and a copyist can never give you that experience because that this this, we, we talk about this kind of triangle of authenticity. So it's the designer, or the, and it's the manufacturer, and, uh, and maybe the, 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 his partner, like a dealer, for example, and it is the consumer. And if this is broken, this triangle, you don't get this experience of authenticity. Sounds philosophical, but the reality is that you buy a fake. How would somebody who does a copy ever 
be able to do the right thing because they never speak to, they never spoke to a designer they never had a conversation they have basically so yeah so it's a it's a tricky topic also on the legal side <laughs> I know. that's and no probably with the EMC, don't you are don't <laughs> don't take me down that road because then i go off for it like is an one hour. of the most copied <laughs> in the world i think yes, the, the yes, chair definitely. and yeah. no it's like and you had a big also fight in China that you sold somehow. It was a very important point for the design world to have the controversial somehow uh, fixed. I don't know, even know which one you're talking about because there's so many of them. <laughs> 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 no, it's interesting because you don't know wh why uh, t uh, time to type people from the other world, uh, they, from outside, they <laughs> ask me, but why it's so expensive? So I said, first of all, it's not expensive at all because it's if you come, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And secondly, because it took uh, so much time to do researches uh, to uh, find the good solution. Also, because today, and I think that Lisa, you experienced this as well. We have new technologies. So for Jap Japonti, for example, as you were explained very well with the plywood we decided to re-edit uh, a particular chest of drawers with new guides inside in order to have uh, the drawers moving uh, more smoothly because today Gioponti would have done the same because he was a person into technology. So he knew that design is evolving and you need to use the best for your uh, final user. So for sure he was the one that would have done the best uh, of the technology today. Exactly, I believe there's first two, uh, I think we, we need to distinguish between, a, in our case, a case of a tell, between what is original and what is vintage. So vintage is antique, is from another time, and original is authentical, and original means this experience to be continued, to know the history, to work with design, so that's why we are the originals of today. And design, uh, especially design, needs to be updated. So Gioponti was into the technology. Nehemiah, when he designed those pieces, he designed for a certain circumstance that probably we need to adjust it for now. The woods, in the case of uh, the most non-Brazilian wood, the Brazilian rosewood, the jacaranda, is almost extinct. We cannot use it anymore. So we need to have all this sustainable resource. We need to update them from what is today, what is our needs, what is our, uh, our, our concerns today. So more sustainable, uh, different, more technological in our way of producing. And this doesn't uh, diminute uh, the originality. On the, from, on, like, I believe on the contrary, it really updated and means that you are continuously working with the legacy and the legacy needs to be updated, needs to be really aligned with today's needs. With the people. With the, with people, the people and what we need today. <laughs> that are so alive that is and design. are changing. Yeah, beca because at the end of the day, design is problem solving and yeah. Charles and Raymond, they were great on doing that, the Brazilian design, the Brazilian message, they were great on doing that in the past and we do have the new contemporary designers as uh, I work also with Patricia Chiola and Cristina Chile and we had the Italians this discussion what are the needs what are the problems okay. that the questions that we need to solve the design needs to solve today perfect oh, I think that the discussion was just started but we have to let's say sum it up so uh, it was really really interesting to have you here I have just one question that I didn't mention before is there a fa favorite masterpiece in your collection, or in your home, or in your heart, or in your one day I would like to? From the, from the Eameses, in this case. <laughs> 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 um, I, I think it really, it really changes. Um, for me, it changes over time, because you, the amazing thing about a legacy is that you, you always discover something new, because you change, the times change, your perspective changes, and that's that's the that that's the beauty about these works. And um, so it's really, if you ask me today, it's maybe a different one than yesterday. And uh, so so it's uh, I think that's for me the really the answer to that tricky question. Yeah, it's, a, <laughs> it's a very uh, good good answer. <laughs> Very tricky is how to ask him what's your favorite so you agree with him. We all I agree. totally agree. I just I would if I can just add that what I like about the favorite piece is more than pieces, more than the static is the story behind it. So for us that we work very into the archives, into their lives, they discover these great stories. If this piece was 
Zalzopin, for instance, favorite pieces. If that pieces was inspired by uh, one of Nehemiah's architectures buildings, so these stories is what fascinates me the most. Thank you very much. Thank you to Maria Cristina for inviting us to Design Miami for having us here, and we we are very curious to dig more into the stories. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Francesca, Lisa, and Eckhart. Uh, Design Miami has always positioned itself as a great platform to, to meet uh, culture and market, and I think that this talk was really an amazing example. So thank you very much to, to, to the, all the speakers. Thank you.